the base product um, is reasonably static. Um, it's the little, you know, it's the fine nuances, I guess, that will be changing. So, well, um, you know, if we can make the widget better all the time, we're always looking to make, uh, you know, a, a smoother ramp up on the controller or a, um, you know, a more um, user-friendly controller or a more user-friendly app for your smartphone so you can um, you can watch what's happening from that as you, you know, out at a pub one night, you can look at your, your smartphone and make sure all the fans are running. Um, that sort of stuff. So it's it's the it's all the fine tuning stuff as opposed to radically reinventing the product. I think that. This is The Ryan Marketing Show and you're listening to episode 74 of 100. Today on the show I have Steve Haslett from New Zealand Frost Fans and we're going to be talking about the role that Frost Fans play in protecting critical crops not only in New Zealand but around the world and how that protects our food supply and what goes into making these innovative frost fans. So it's great to have Steve on the show and uh, let's listen a little bit more about what Steve has got to say. It's crop protection but it's also yield and quality enhancement. Um, so we do as much business now for people looking to improve their yields as what we would be trying to actually do frost uh, protection. Okay. So it's as much about cold damage as frost protection. Right, so the, the less damage you can have on the vines or on your pit fruit, stone fruit, the more money you're going to get because of how that gets graded before it goes for export. Correct, and and also the better yield. So take grapes for example. If you get the you get a really good set on the first flowering, that's going to give you maximum volume. Um, and if you've got um, nice short and no lengths because the plant hasn't been putting a whole bunch of vegetative growth, it's been putting separate into growing. Um, flowers and fruit, you'll get more bunches per meter, so you're going to get more grapes, so yields go up. Does that mean that as a, a business you need to get into the actual, their business and understand what's most meaningful? No, look, we, we never pretend to be you know, agronomists or growers, we need to have some understanding and you know, be able to at least put them in touch with other people that can talk their language, um, but we don't pretend to be you know, apple growers or grape growers or avocado growers or almond growers or citrus or whatever else other crop wrong because there's too many crops you know we're going to get it wrong right is there much there must be some difference between each of those the you know seasonality or um yeah the level of protection that's required how do you go about producing a product that works in all those different types of seasons and harvests the principle is the same the whole way through so we're, we're trying to um utilize the warmer air that's um sitting at the top of the inversion layer of the um, radiation frost or a, and just on a cold night, it doesn't have to be a frost, and bring that warmer air down and mix it around the orchard or vineyard. Um, so whether that's on citrus in the middle of winter to protect the fruit, or whether it's on a spring crop with um, you know, flowering on grapes or you know, bud burst on um, stone fruit or apples, it's the same principle. Right, so regardless of crop, the way that air moves or doesn't move, depending on... The physics the same. Right. Yeah, yeah. and so then, what will change is the uh, individual growers will um, fine tune the product. So they might start it at um, you know, 0.5 of a degree on grapes. They might start it at, um, if they're trying to protect their kiwi fruit in the middle of winter just to keep um, PSA away. They might um, start it at two degrees and just keep it before, oh, sorry minus two degrees and keep it before. Right. So you've actually got control using the frost fans down to what temperature you can keep the whole crop at. No, no. That's what temperature it starts at. So they start remotely, so you can preset the temperature where you want them to start. And then as soon as the um, canopy, well depending on where you've got your probe set, but typically the canopy, when the canopy hits that temperature, then the fan will start up. Got it. And then when it gets warmer, it'll turn itself off. Now we were talking before, um, we chatted on this interview about when people buy their, their first frost fans, and sometimes that's as a preventative measure, and other times that's after the damage has been done. Um, what, 
what do you then go about doing when you get a, a call from a horticulturalist or a um, wine grower where they've got no frost fans at the moment? How do you go about designing it for their particular farm or, or um, setup? Um, the initial stage is just to look at a Google map. Um, we can then uh, just do the overlay of how the, how the warming footprint looks on a Google map. Um, once we've got that as an initial cut, if you like, then we just meet them on site and look at all the... You see a lot more when you're on site, you see some, a bit more of the contour, um, get a better understanding of you know, how good the information is in terms of drift on a cold night, which is probably the most important thing you need. So where does a cold air come from on a cold night? That's going to help us position the fans in the best place. Um, and then all the little things, you know, the infrastructural things like, you know, where the, where the head works for the water, you know, anything else running through, overhead power lines, you might have seen, all that sort of stuff. So then that'll just um, fine tune with the final placement goes. Okay. And now walking through your factory here, there's a number of different elements to it. We've just seen uh, the engine, the, the power plant for the frost fans, the propellers themselves, the towers, um, the curing process and getting the exact aerodynamic properties of the, each of the fan blades correct. Um, how does the, the, the team operate as a whole? Because those are all different kind of skill sets and abilities to bring all of this together into one product that can go into your can uh, container and get uh, exported out. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, how does the whole business fit together to produce that? Um, well, we Ultimately, we have, a, we have a plan for the year, what we're trying to do. But then on a day-to-day -day basis, it's um, we're producing to, to stock effectively. Um, so we know how many units we need to produce every day. And it's just making sure that we're hitting those numbers so everybody knows their role in the process. So if they understand what they have to do, um, then it doesn't become too big. You know, it's, I've just got to do this bit for the day, and I know everything else will fall onto place. Um, the more information we can share, the better, because then they understand the bigger picture. But ultimately, it's what they're doing you know, in their own workstation, really, that, that they are more focused on. And on each of those workstations, a lot of this is, is all manufactured here. Yeah, so the, um, certainly the blades are totally manufactured here from resin and cloth. Um, the, we don't manufacture the engines, we import the engines, but then we fit them up. So we, we'll change the plumbing, we'll put build our own mufflers, we build our own controllers, we build our own uh, way we throttle the machines automatically. So all that sort of stuff is, is done on site. We build our own clutches. Um, so we, we build some of the bits, but we, we do a lot of assembly as well. Now with any of these types of uh, machines that have uh, got a running state on and off, um, there's always things that can go wrong if it doesn't have enough liquids or enough power. Um, what type of things Technology-wise, have you got in place to make sure you, you, know, you can monitor those different levels? Um, all the um, machines are started and stopped on temperature, and those temperatures are sent by radios. So the receiving radio on the machine is, can also transmit. So it can transmit all the information that is in the controller uh, back to a base station. We'll pick it up and we send it out to the, the cloud, pick it up and um, message that information in the great internet of things and turn it into something that people can understand. So that any grower or ourselves, we can sit there and see uh, any um, farm on any night and see which machines are running, which machines are ready to run, or if there's any fault status, um, whether they've got fuel, whether the batteries are good, all that sort of stuff. So we know um, we can give the, the grower peace of mind, but we also give ourselves peace of mind, I guess. And if someone rings up and says, oh, I think machine D4 is, is been, you know, doing something funny, we can have a look and see how it's run in the last few nights and see when it started and stopped and what it's done relative to the other machines around it. Um, so we can, before we go there, we can be pre-armed in terms of, you know, is there an issue with it or um, is it just a, you know, a climatic effect that's, that's um, having an influence on the machine? That's got to be a great peace of mind to, to have those machines out protecting your crop. Some of these crops are worth you know, millions or, or tens of millions of dollars. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, depending on the crop type, one fan could be protecting a million dollars. Um, so each fan will protect, depending on the crop type, somewhere between, um, you know, if it's got a lot of shelter belts around kiwi fruit, it might be five hectares, uh, but it's on a big area of grapes where there's no you know, uh, boundaries in between, it might be like seven and a half hectares. If it's on a, 
on a really warm area in South Africa, it might be eight or nine hectares because some of those you know, they're almost um, uh, desert conditions where it's extremely hot during the day and very, very cold at night. Um, so you get enormous inversions. So the bigger the inversion, the bigger the area you can protect. So forgive me if this is a dumb question, but I would assume for anyone growing crops now that these types of fans would already be installed. And if they're not, what have they been doing up until now before they call up NZ Frost fans and say, hey, we've got a problem, or hey, we're finally wanting to protect our crops? A number of things, I guess. One is um, climatic change, um, and that's just more extreme rather than, you know, uh, climatic warming, um, where you'll just get random events and you'll get a big cold snap come through and it'll cause significant damage. Um, change in variety of, of material, so you're changing from you know, an older variety of apple to a new variety of apple. It flowers earlier so it gets back into more, only used to flower two or three weeks earlier and it's back into more of the winter conditions when it's going to be colder. Um, so you've got to protect them there. Um, you know, changing your grapes from Sauvignon to Chardonnay or the Baron, so you need to protect it. Well, whatever the little um, varietal changes that causes the, them to be more susceptible. Um, and then you've got, I guess, just new land being developed, and then the new land being developed tends to be on the other more frost prone land or the cold land, because uh, all the good stuff's gone. Of course. So, um, as, you, as you want to you know, take the sheep station next door to you and turn that into an orchard or a vineyard. It's further up the valley where previously perhaps people hadn't thought to grow. Um, now the, uh, the market price goes up, you know, supply and demand works and you plant more. Um, and so it's probably those three factors, right? Climatic change, uh, varietal change, and then just new developments. Interesting. Okay, so are there, are there any um, you know, more macro events that are happening where certain countries that didn't need frost protection now do? Um, yeah, look, there's a bit of that. Certainly in uh, countries like uh, South Africa, um, or even regions like the Barossa in Australia. I mean, a number of years, you know, almost no, no cold damage coming through. Um, and uh, great price, not particularly flash. Um, once the great price came up, um, then that seemed to coincide with a number of um, colder, cold events that came through. Um, so where there was very few sales there for probably 10 years, it's been a regular, um, very strong market for the last um, four or five years. Um, so you're getting some of those, those changes. Um, and, and just, I think probably the, the price of the product is the, is the biggest change. So as the demand for food goes up, as the demand for, um, and I guess probably some of the new protein crops like um, nuts, um, almonds, walnuts, hazelnuts, Macadamias, um, all high value crop now with an increasing demand on. Um, and you can grow them at you know, one tonne a hectare, you can grow them at four tonne a hectare, depending on how good you can manage the crop. And you know, we're not the, we don't answer all the questions, but we, we can answer some of them with, um, by ameliorating some of that cold damage. Which countries are, are seeing the most growth for the type of um, frost fans that you're protecting? Are there particular Places that there are you know, increasing levels of crops being planted for for this type of thing. Um, I guess New Zealand's been very strong for us in the last few years, just because New Zealand's good at being early adopters of technology. Right? And this technology is not particularly new; it's been around in the states for a long time. Um, New Zealand's picked it up and run with it very well. Um, and certainly, as the as the crop ownership changes, so as more corporates come in. Uh, tend to be less risk adverse if they can um, if they can alleviate or mitigate a risk they will um, whether it be drought with irrigation or you know cold with frost fans they'll, um, they'll try and get rid of that risk whereas if you've got a mum and dad grower they might just take the risk because they don't want to spend the capital um, so it's just a change in, in ownership um, Australia's picking it up now and starting to adopt it more um, you're seeing exactly the same trend I guess with the, with the buying behaviour of the growers. Yeah. Um, and then we're seeing a little bit of that starting to come through in countries like South Africa now. Um, and so we we hope that we can um, you know, take the product to where the, <laughs> where the demand is. How does it compare for some of the, you know, the alternatives where you do want to protect your crop, but more you want to protect the, um, 
the potential revenue or income that it represents rather than the actual crop. Um, so that there's insurance companies that will insure you against, but it almost seems like the horse is bolted, why not um, protect the actual revenue source? Yeah, and, and, and I guess a big part of that depends on your size. So if you're um, a contract grower into you know, a mass market, then it's, it's pro insurance may work for, work for you for a short time. Eventually the insurance company gets um, uh, is going to become tired of paying out every year because their payout is going to be more than the premium. Yeah. Um, but the, um, the biggest thing for most of the growers is they want to retain shelf space because once they get bigger, if they lose their space in the supermarket or they lose their um, label volume on their label of wine, um, then they can't get it back the next year because another competing products come along and take the space. Oh, yeah, so it's more the downstream effects. You're, you're creating an opportunity for a competitor to yeah. get into that marketplace. So, um, you know, if you're a big almond grower and you've got a major client that takes almonds, you don't want one year not to buy many almonds because you'll have another grower. And next year, he doesn't want to buy yours because he's got another, another grower. So, it's, it's that sort of um, supply chain stuff that's it's pretty important to the, you know, maintaining your price on the market. Right, so it's more than just protecting the crop, it's actually protecting your supply chain yep. from the consequences of not being able to supply. That's, that's certainly part of it. And, and also just keeping on improving your quality. Um, and the, the effect of coal damage can be, can be felt for a number of years after the coal event. So you know, after you've you know, talked to growers and they've had the fans in for four or five years, they're getting into a nice steady state of, of good yields, good quality, um, you know, things are nice as opposed to trying to recover from a bad year where you know, everything got burnt and a, and a frost or just got you know, really poor yields because of cold coming through. So that's interesting because I think you know, growing up here we, there were frost years and there were non-frost years. So with this technology it protects the core part of the plant so that you've got some consistency. Yep. Um, what, what does that then mean if um, your fruit is at a higher export grade does that then give you your more premium into your market? Is that oh, absolutely. Um, the the you know the, if you can you know more about economics than I do, I'm sure. But you only have to have a, a small increase in, in the price to significantly increase your margin. Um, all your growing costs are going to be the same. You know, you're still doing all the same things every year. So if you can get into that premium price growth, um, then you can double and quadruple the margin. On the, property as opposed to um, you know, just surviving, or just surviving. So quite a smart way of actually increasing the revenue from the same size crop just through a better crop that's had better protection on it and therefore grows to maybe just a better skin quality on the outside of that. All of those factors, yeah. Um, and look, there's a number of factors that go into that. So you'll, you know, there'll be other, on kiwi fruit, you know, if you've got a good shelf, you'll stop rubber, so you'll stop some of that, that downgrade. Um, so it's it's not doing you know we don't hold all the all the answers as I said but it's just one one component that we can we can help with. You've still got to have water. You've still got to have the right fertilising regime. You've still got to prune it correctly. All the rest of it. Overall, where does that sit on the picking scheme? Where does the, the frost fan sit in the in the wish list? I think it's going to vary by crop type, but um, if you get a bad frost year. Um, then you can have zero crop, so that's a you know, that's a catastrophic event. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know we put some fans on a um, avocado grower in Portugal, and um, he had lost his trees and everything. Um, so when he replanted, he, he put fans on it. Um, it's three, four years ago now, and he's um, he's very happy. He's got good crop. He's got new trees. It's all you know, the world's good again. It's just so, that peace of mind that you've gone through such a trauma too, because it's. Mm real hard labour to get a crop up to a certain level, so to Absolutely. lose it all in one early morning event must be soul destroying. Absolutely, and it's um, the same in the, you know, the broth on the, on the grapes, um, some days there after there's been a, in the, in the, uh, a few years ago there was a bad frost went through and there was just, you could see green, nice green circles where the hands were and you could see big black areas all outside and they were just uh, there was crop and no crop. It was just chalk and cheese. But those, like I say, those are the catastrophic events. They're sort of almost the no-brainers. It's the, the small incremental yield and, and quality that is the real winner, I think.
because that's where it's that insidious creep you get where you're, you know, you're just not quite getting enough crop to, to make this thing economic, where you can turn that around quite quickly. So what's the um, you know, this market saturation like in Hawke's Bay? So you're based here in the Michael Road, um, and obviously we're surrounded by, you know, this is a great country, we've got Gimlet Gravels just up the road. Um, are there your fans everywhere? Is this kind of home turf for you? Um, no, it's probably not actually. Um, so in the early, I, I got involved in the business in 2007. Um, prior to that, there was a lot of imported uh, fans here. Um, now we would certainly have the majority of the fans in the, in the district. Um, so there's a lot of historical, I mean, once the fans there, it's there for uh, 25 years, it's not going to go away anyway. So there's a lot of historical fans out there. Um, but we've got a lot of the new fans on, on the district. So, and to be honest, back then I thought the area was pretty well set, um, saturated. Um, but new varieties, uh, more development has meant that we've probably doubled the number of fans in the last um, three years that were in the in the region. So Do you, when been, when you've got one of the you know, a new customer coming on board that already has some legacy fans that have been imported? Do yours interwork with them, or do you replace them and put all you know the Frost Boss fan labels in there? No, that? well, absolutely. I mean, the, the, all the fans will still move there, and that's what they're trying to do. Um, we just think they move it better than the other ones. Um, but no, the, our fans will work alongside other fans. Um, we will um, service other models and brand makes, so we'll, um, we'll pick up a service contract if that's what they want. Um, if there's upgrades needed, we can upgrade the other vans to, um, to whether it be with a new controller. You know, some of the old models are if they've been around for 20 years. The electronics have moved a long way, um, so or it could be new blades set on. Um, whatever it needs, you know, we can uh, we can upgrade all, all types of vans. What are some of the key differences? that someone's going to notice between the fans that you deliver versus what they've already got um, you know, on the blade. How does it move air in a, in a better way? Okay, well it gets reasonably typically. <laughs> Hold on to your hats people, we're going to, we're going to get our, our um, technical hit on that. The, we, what we've tried to do with the, the C49 fan is to move, to get the, the air speed coming off the fan um, the same across the whole diameter of the fan, um, which means you get a big solid plenum of air that can move out through the vineyard of the orchard. So almost like a, a shock wave, is that how? Um, if you think of it more like a big um, cylinder of air moving out, um, that has got the same wind speed right the way through the middle of it. Um, if you look at some of the older um, two blade technology, you get very fast wind speed off the tips and slow wind speed in the middle. Which means that the fast air gets re entrained by the cold air, by the slower air as it goes out, so it doesn't travel as far. Um, and so, by having a solid plenum of air, you can make it travel further, um, which means you can travel, you can rotate the fan a bit slower because the fans rotate around the mast. Um, as you travel a bit slower, you can push it a bit further because it's facing one direction for longer. Um, and then you've, you've still got to come back to replace that air you've moved, but you can, and it's about fine tuning that to get the best amount of air moving the, the furthest distance. Um, and then we try and, and as part of making that fan more efficient to do that, um, we can use less horsepower, so we use less fuel, um, and we can make it quieter, because any, any noise is a byproduct. So you're not trying to make noise, but it's energy, so it costs you to make that energy. Noise is just energy. And if for those in a, in a relatively, maybe in a lifestyle block area or more of a built up part of um, the country, uh, you know, what's the what's the noise output on a fan, and are there different options depending on you know how close the neighbours are? Yeah, there are. So um, the I mean, our standard fan that we do is the C49, um, and that uh, meets all the noise regulations of um, the councils throughout New Zealand and most of Australia. Um, and those so every fan that goes in needs a consent. Um, and uh, that consent is primarily based around the noise you make and the distance you can be to the boundary of your neighbour. Um, so the, the C, by putting more blades in you can spin the fan slower. So if you've got two blades you've got to spin it quite fast. A lot of the noise comes off the tip. 
Um, and it's that tip noise, like a big helicopter coming through, you get that wop, wop, wop noise. Yeah. Um, whereas if you can spin that slower, uh, that noise decreases. So the more blades you have, the slower the spin, the, slower the, the less the noise. The less the noise. Got it. So our five blade is, is the quietest we do, and that gets, um, for example, that'll get you within 180 metres of the boundary um, on the standard noise requirements of most councils, uh, whereas the four blade will be 240 metres from the boundary. Um, and so it's that sort of difference by adding another blade. That's great innovation to be able to produce out of um, your, your base here. You guys must be pretty proud of what you've built here. Yeah, look, look we are, and, and certainly um, all the guys at the shop have a lot of pride in what they do. You know, they're very, um, they take great satisfaction in, in, you know, as we communicate with them, the, the different customers we've got and the different crop types and where they're working and what they're doing. And I mean, everybody likes um, to know what you do actually makes a difference. And uh, there's nothing nicer than when you bring some of the um, customers through the plant and they'll have a chat to the guys and say, you know, it's, it's great because my what, whatever crop I've got is, is just done you know, significantly better than what it used to do. So it's, um, that makes it feel good. Now, I notice on your, um, your site you've got some really um, strong branding um, with New Zealand Frost fans and also the Frost Boss, which has been trademarked. Um, how important is that in your export markets? to you know, grow that not just that people need fans to protect their, their um, crops from frost but to make sure that they're known about the Frost Boss trademark brand. Yeah, so the, 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 the product brand of, of Frost Boss and in particular if it's a four blade it's a Frost Boss C49 that, that transcends all markets. The New Zealand Frost uh, fans is just the New Zealand company that makes them. So for in Australia, our Australian company is called Believe it or not, Australian frost fans. <laughs> so it's a very simple, um, it's a very simple model, really. Um, and as we go off further offshore, it just they just pick up the name. Well, that, I think that makes it relatively easy for anyone um, for for SEO, for search engine optimization, because if they don't know what type of brand fan they want, yeah. they're searching for Australian frost fans. They're probably likely to find yours pretty quickly. Yeah, exactly. So it's a very it's a very simple um, model that we've adopted, but it um, yeah it works. With where do you take the, you know, with, with technology there's always things, you know, things keep on moving forward. With fans, how fast is that evolution? How, that, how quickly do you have to be upgrading components? Um, look, I think the, the base product um, is reasonably static. Um, it's the little, you know, it's the fine nuances I guess that will be changing. So we'll, um, you know, if we can make the widget better all the time, we're always looking to make uh, you know, a smoother ramp up on the controller or a, um, you know, a more um, user-friendly controller or a more user-friendly app for your smartphone so you can, um, you can watch what's happening from that as you're you know, out at a pub one night. You can look at your, your smartphone and make sure all the fans are running, um, that sort of stuff. So it's, it's, the, it's all the fine tuning stuff as opposed to radically reinventing the fan, I think, now. Now, with, you, you talked earlier on about the, you know, the size of your team. Um, what does it take, you know, what do you look for in employees to you know, help build these fans in the various different departments of the business? What type, if someone's listening here thinking, hey, could this be a type of career for me? What sh attributes should they have? Oh, I think the biggest thing we always look for is attitude. Um, so if, uh, they've got the right attitude and, and want to learn, um, then we think that it's, you know, we can train most of it. It's not, uh, you know, building frost fans, it's not, it's, it's a very small industry, it's very niche. So it's not something that you can, you know, there's not a ready market, you can go and find people that have had experience in it. Um, whether it be, you know, installing them or servicing them or um, building them in the factory or um, selling them in terms of um, how they function in the, in the marketplace. And that's all stuff that we tend to train in house, and so we just look for attitude, really. Um, yeah, yeah, that'd be the that'd be the biggest thing. And you recently extended your workshop here in Omaha Road. Mm -hmm. How long do you think that will uh, keep you in good stead before we have to extend it again? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that depends on on the attitude to offshore markets and whether you should be producing in offshore markets or producing in New Zealand. Um, we, we can produce uh, probably 600 out of this plant now, 600 a year. Um, 
and if we, we're pretty keen to keep the production in New Zealand. Um, the freight component, putting them in a container and sending them anywhere in the world is not great compared to the, um, the value of the product. Um, and it, um, yeah, it, it still gives you a good feeling to produce stuff in New Zealand, I think. So to be part of the manufacturing industry in New Zealand is, is good. And I think you're, you're probably quite well positioned where things are going, although globalisation has been the, the kind of the default blueprint for the last 70 years, who knows what it's going to be for the next 70? Yeah, there seems to be a little bit of backlash against globalisation at the moment, if you look at America, but um, it's, you know, as I say, I mean, we, we think that we can add more value with good skills and good people building them here, is what we can by building them other parts of the world. Um, and our guys um, will fly around the world and install them and, and it's, it's a good part of the process too. They get to see those guys that have been to um, you know, Turkey and Portugal and Italy and Canada and other parts around the world. Have, um, you know, it's, a great, it's a great bit of experience right? you get to see and working in different countries is a lot different to just travelling in them. So it's, um, it's, Very much so. Huh? Yeah. Do they have any particular favourite countries that they all scramble to say, hey, I, I want to install those in, in you know, Turkey or in America? Is there a particular you know, pecking order? No, look, I, I think it's um, it's just a bit of an adventure. Really. So it's, it's they're pretty, most of the guys are pretty keen on, um, on whichever geography. Um, probably get, if they haven't done a lot of travelling, they can be a little bit um, daunted by places like Turkey. But it's... Um, no problems at all. In fact, it's been a pleasant place, very hospitable, great people to work with. Fantastic. So not only do you get the, you know, the, the career opportunities here, working in some really interesting parts, either on engines or through the aerodynamics or through um, some of the fiberglass, but you've got this opportunity to travel, install, meet different cultures and, and do something to you know, make New Zealand proud. Exactly. And I mean, obviously not everybody gets to travel. But, um, if you're at that end of the business where we're, where we're selling and installing, then, uh, then the, the opportunities are there, yeah. Do you get to do much travel and, and install, or is that kind of, you've done your, your hard yards now? Uh, no, I've done a lot of travel. Um, my install skills probably aren't good enough, the guys are better than me. Um, but certainly, um, I still spend a lot of time on the road, yeah. Which is, and the customers, which is, yeah, where are I think that's something that's come through on many of the interviews is that the owners of the business still do a lot of the business development, a lot of the meetings, the relationship making, because without that, everything else can't happen smoothly. Well, you, you get first-hand exposure to it, which helps you make the calls. Um, if you're getting filtered information on, on the markets in particular, then you, know, you can't make the wrong call. So, so, and it, to be honest, it's a very enjoyable part too. You know, that's, the, that's the fun part is, is talking to the customers and understanding what they're doing and, and what the potential is and um, you know, what the product's doing for them. Great, well, that's been a really useful insight, not only into you know, your business and New Zealand Frost Pans, um, but also understanding a little bit of the technology that underpins what is protecting crops and food for you know, what is a, a growing population on our planet. And hopefully, um, it, it, yeah, the, the uptake of the fans continues because it's, um, it's been good for us so far. Well, if the weather keeps on you know, doing the, the variations and we are continuing to grow you know, crops across the, the world, I'm, I'm sure you're uh, in very good stead for that. Cool. That's Thanks right. very much for your time today, Seth. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers. If you like this episode, remember to subscribe for free on iTunes. Simply search for The Ryan Marketing Show in the iTunes Store.